Okay, so let's get started with the last lecture. Okay, last lecture. Um, and we stopped 10 minutes before, right? Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Well, okay, yeah. Some might say, unfortunately. I... <laughs> okay. Um, so, yes, uh, it is usual to begin your talks with uh, saying who your collaborators were, and I just realized that I've skipped that four times in a row. So, everything that I've, you know, any, everything that I've mentioned was um, either someone else's work or it was joint work with uh, Toti Daskalopoulos, who was here last week, uh, Natasha Sesum, Tom Ilmanen, Juanjo Velasquez, and David Cha. Um, okay, so today I want to, so this hour I'm going to talk about uh, ancient solutions, and um, it's, uh, the word makes me feel a bit old because there are all these things that people are calling ancient solutions that didn't exist when I was a graduate student, so how old am I? Um, so what is an ancient solution? Ancient solution to mean curvature flow is, um, it's a solution that is defined for all t less than or equal to zero, or uh, more generally less than or equal to some time. But the important thing is that the solution is, exists for all negative times. Uh, so what are examples of ancient solutions? So uh, if you allow yourself to think of non-compact solutions, um, any minimal surface is an ancient solution because it's stationary. Um, the sphere. So S, N, minus, so S2 sitting in R3 with radius uh, square root, uh, two square root minus two. Um, or the cylinder. with slightly smaller radius. These are all self-similar solutions that you may have seen in the first week. They're uh, solitons, they're self-similar solutions, self-shrinkers. Um, and they, they vanish, so usually one looks at these in forward time and they, come up, they show up as uh, blow-up models for singularities of mean curvature flow. Uh, of course, if you, have, uh, if you have one of these self-shrinkers that is moving by, uh, just by similarity, then you can follow it backward in time. Uh, as far as you like. So this thing is defined for all negative times t. Uh, any other self-shrinker that you have, and there are many, uh, also counts as an ancient solution. Um, why do we study uh, ancient solutions? So uh, one reason is, uh, one partial reason is that they show up as blow-up models for singularities of mean curvature flow. Uh, that does not justify the ones that I'm interested in. Uh, I, I want to talk about all convex ancient solutions. Um, other reasons for studying uh, ancient solutions could be, and I'm, I'm making this up a little bit, but uh, so there's one paper uh, uh, called Curve Lengthening, which uh, by three Japanese author, one of them is called Wadati. And they study curve lengthening, which is curve shortening, but with, uh, with a minus in front of the curvature. In other words, it's, it's uh, curve shortening going backwards in time, which is an ill-posed problem, of course. Um, but these things, so you could look at velocity equals minus mean curvature. Uh, that's an ill-posed problem because it's mean curvature going backward in time, right? So if mean curvature make things automatically smooth, so if you start a real analytic, so if you start with a hypersurface that is only C infinity but not real analytic, then there is no solution going backward in time. Um, so it's, it's very ill-posed. Uh, but these things could come up as, um, you know, approximations to higher order equations. You could say you could, um, and now here to keep it well-posed, I believe you need a minus sign, but I, so I don't want to talk about that. So minus epsilon times this. So there is a well-posed equation where for smooth solutions with nicely bounded curvature, this term is actually uh, bounded and the solutions that you get are, uh, as long as the curvatures are bounded, are close to backward solutions to mean curvature flow. So it, it, uh, it might be worth um, 
considering these. Uh, so, and then uh, convex mean curvature flow, ancients, the study of ancient solutions, um, as I'll, I'll, I want to show you in a, in a couple of minutes, I think it's just a very natural mathematical question. Um, okay, so, Let me begin by what is known, and this may repeat uh, things that you've seen last week, I'm, I don't know for sure. Uh, so convex solutions, convex ancient solutions. So there is one, uh, so of course the circle, so line, that's the minimal surface, the line sits still, circle, Its radius is square root minus 2t. Notice this minus 2t, that radius is the same as the radius of this cylinder, because this cylinder is just that circle cross a line. Um, then there is uh, what Matt Grayson and Steve Altschuler have called the Grim Reaper. It is a solution, it has this form. And actually, there's an explicit expression for it. If you make it a graph like this, it is y is minus log cosine x. Um, what it does is it moves with constant velocity in this direction just by translation. Uh, so what I wrote before, you can think of backward uh, curve shortening as some approximation to some other well-posed problem. Uh, this thing has another name in other circles, so, uh, so applied mathematicians know this thing as the Safman-Taylor finger. Uh, and they have a, there's some model for fluid flow where you have an unstable fluid and then at some point you perturb it a little, a boundary between two fluids, you perturb it a little bit and then uh, the perturbation is unstable and grows. And the, the, the simplest description that they have is this thing but going in the other direction. And it's, it's, uh, it comes about as an ancient solution of mean curvature flow. Um, okay, then there is the paper clip. This thing which um, has an explicit expression and uh, it's kind of a strange expression. So let me, if you uh, take this, so if as coordinate on your curve, you take the tangent angle and if you specify the curvature k theta, so if you know the curvature at each point as a function of the tangent angle, you can reconstruct the curve. So that's an exercise in differential geometry. Um, Oh boy, what was the formula? So there's a formula that looks like this, cosine theta minus something like this. So I would put this in quotation marks, right? There, there's a formula, it looks like this, um, and its derivation is, so you can just substitute it in the equation. The equation is kt equals k squared k theta theta plus k. It's better if you write an equation for k squared, and if you do that, you substitute this, and you find very quickly that this satisfies the equation. There are, um, so I think I wrote this thing up the first time. I found it in a coffee shop somewhere. Uh, there are, um, before that, there is uh, work by Galaktionov. Who studied solutions not thinking about mean curvature flow at all or any kind of curvature, just thinking about quasi-linear parabolic equations, uh, looked at solutions of this kind of PD and uh, found a whole bunch of explicit solutions and this thing is actually a special case of that, of the, the family that he found, okay? So um, if you take that one and you interpret, you take this formula and you interpret it what it looks like as, um, as a curve, it looks like this, and what is it, so what is, what is the, uh, okay, so this is one time uh, snapshot, how is it moving? Uh, well, in backward time, this is moving in that direction and that is moving in this direction, so in forward time you have these two, two ends that are coming together, um, and then in the end it becomes a circle. 
what is the asymptotic shape of these? Um, they are Grim Reapers or Safman Taylor fingers, depending on which direction of time you go in. Um, then there is a theorem. by uh, Daskalopoulos and Sesum saying that uh, if, uh, if CT, their curves, is a, and now there are three conditions, compact, Convex three conditions, compact, convex, ancient. Oh, embedded. You might consider uh, curves that have self intersections, and uh, then you can find more uh, ancient solutions. So if you have a compact, convex, and embedded ancient solution, then CT is either, it's one of these examples. So it's either a circle, these two are not compact so they don't count, it's either a circle or the paper clip. Okay, so then um, there are more examples of ancient solutions uh, in the plane that show that each of these three conditions is necessary. This, so in a sense, this is the best possible theorem of this type that can be proved. So further examples, and these are due to Qian Yu, Qian Yu. Who in her thesis Prove the existence of a whole bunch of other um, uh, ancient solutions. So, uh, and instead of writing, so I'll just draw, I'll draw pictures of them. So, uh, one, the simplest one was already found in the paper by Wadati in 1994, I think. Um, they found, the, they also found this solution independently, and they had the good idea to say, well, this is true for all values of t. I can translate this thing in time. In particular, I can translate this thing by uh, pi over pi over two times i in time, right? In a complex time direction. It's a formula. You can it's algebra. You can just do it. This hyperbolic cotangent then becomes a uh, hyperbolic tangent. Um, various signs change here, and you get a formula for another solution. And this is what it looks like. It's the ancient sign. So it's not a compact solution. Okay, so what, are these, what does this look like? It's a periodic array of Grim Reapers, uh, one up, one down, one up, one down. And so under curve shortening, this is moving in, this is moving up, this one is moving up, this one is moving down. They all have the same width, and they're all moving at the same velocity. And as time goes to plus infinity, so this is an ancient solution. You can follow it back in time. Uh, but in forward time, it, uh, you can also follow it forever and ever. And what it does is it, uh, after a while, it becomes flat and it'll, um, it converges to the x-axis. And by linearization, you can actually show, which is not hard, is that um, this profile actually becomes sine, a multiple of the sine. It, be, it becomes almost a solution. It becomes asymptotic to a solution to the linear heat equation. So it's just the first Fourier coefficient, Fourier term that uh, survives. So that justifies, uh, doubly justifies the name ancient sine curve. So what Xian Yu found is that this is an ex there's an explicit formula for this thing. Um, that's perhaps an accident. There happens. So it turns out that there's no re no need to um, to take these distances. Uh, to take these things equally spaced, you can put them anywhere you like. So you can take uh, take any sequence of vertical lines. With arbitrary distances between them. Then there is a solution to, ancient solution to curve shortening. 
that is, consists of Grim Reapers asymptotic to these lines. Um, so you have, the, you, you have the freedom to put these vertical, and so you can make an infinite array of these. Uh, the only condition that you need is that the spacing, the distance between the lines has to be uniformly bounded and uniformly bounded away from zero. But then apart from that, arbitrary. So that gives you one sequence of choices. And then the other choices is, so these tips move pretty much with constant velocity until they come here somewhere, but far away, uh, back, you know, it used to be long ago that these things were down there. Uh, and then they're, they're almost Grim Reapers and they're moving with constant velocity. So that means that the height of this thing is the velocity of that Grim Reaper. If you rescale a uh, Grim Reaper, if you make it narrower, its curvature becomes larger and it moves faster. So the velocity of a Grim Reaper is proportional to the distance between its asymptotes. Uh, so these, these Grim Reapers have, all have different velocities depending on the width of the strips in which they live. So this is velocity times time, and then there is a, uh, a constant C. So you can prescribe these constants in each, in each strip, you can also adjust this constant. So there, there's a, uh, the set of ancient solutions of this type is really flexible. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, I understand the question. Um, I would guess so, but she didn't look into that, and I haven't, uh, haven't given it thought. So, but yeah, it sounds like that should be possible. Right, so the, the limiting thing would be some curve like this. Um, if you, right, these Cs, if you make these large enough and different enough, then in the long run, right. So yeah, there's, there should that there should be a construction like that that works. But I I certainly have not worked out the detail, and she she also didn't. Yeah. Okay. So other examples that she constructed are. Um, okay. So what does this show? Uh, these are ancient embedded solutions, but they are not compact and they're not convex. So. Um, Um, okay, so she also constructed one of these, so call, I call these things trombones. Okay, so you, you draw a couple of horizontal lines, you number them, and then you just go back and forth connecting them by, uh, by Grim Reapers asymptotic to those horizontal lines. And so each of these Grim Reapers, so in backward time they move with constant velocity, so this thing will move, this point has coordinate velocity times time plus uh, some offset. And so what she showed is that you can pick an arbitrary finite number of lines like this, you can prescribe these offsets. And the one I drew is compact, but it doesn't have to be compact. You can, uh, you can also make non, you know, uh, This one is not, sorry, this one is compact. They don't have to be, uh, this one is convex in the sense it has no inflection points. It, it's not embedded, but it has no inflection points. This one is uh, not convex. It has an inflection point here somewhere, and so there's another one here somewhere. Um, okay, so you can make uh, ancient solutions of this type. Uh, what this shows is that, so this thing is, it, it is compact. It is convex. It's not embedded. Um, okay, and then there should be another one, which is the ancient spiral, and so, so far there is no proof of those, but I, I think, um, so she was about to construct these things, but then she got a job in finance, uh, so there, there should be a, a solution of this type. So there exists a self-similar solution that does not translate, it rotates, and so Matt Grayson and uh, Steve Altschuler called this the yin-yang curve. 
So it's an, it's an, an infinite spiral. Uh, hope this ends well. Yeah, okay, so there's this thing and it, it spirals on forever. So what you could do is you could take these two ends and connect them by Grim Reaper. Okay, um, so going backwards in time, what this thing, going backwards in time, what this thing does is first of all, it rotates like that. Well, backwards in time, it will rotate like this. Right, this, if forward in the time, this moves in this direction, this moves in that direction. Um, and then uh, this will move inwards. So if you go backwards in time, this thing will just uh, go out and fill up the whole space. So there should be a solution that looks like this. This thing is uh, compact, embedded. It's just not convex because it has, exact, it has one inflection point here and another one over here. Okay, so that's for curve shortening. I don't think so. In fact, I would, uh, conjecture is a big word, but I would, I would, uh, I would guess that uh, uh, the ones that she found are the only ones with finite total curvature. So that they, uh, so ancient solutions with finite total curvature have to have uh, all the possible limits that you can get out of those will be Grim Reapers. And I would say that all of them have to have parallel asymptotes and they should be, they should be of, the, of this type, should be in this list. Okay, so R3 and higher. So first there is Huskin's theorem. Convex ancient solutions. So Huskin's theorem was uh, um, the first theorem that I read on, on mean curvature flow. Uh, it says that if uh, mt, if m0 is compact and convex, then mt shrinks to a round point, i.e. It is some point plus square root minus t times a sphere of an appropriate ratio, uh, radius. So take any convex surface, it'll shrink, it'll shrink to a point, and if you, if you look really near that point and then magnify it so that the thing becomes, uh, adds a reasonable size, it converges to a sphere. So this is, and uh, the year is 1986. I may be off by one or two years. Okay, so this is a theorem that is, uh, it's the best possible theorem that you can prove here. So actually he proved it in uh, dimensions three and higher, so for two dimensional surface and then uh, for some reason uh, his proof doesn't work for curves in the plane uh, because he used, okay, so let me, let me, not, exp let me not explain why. So uh, Gage and Hamilton proved the analogous statement uh, in the plane. Okay, so uh, it's the best possible statement. It basically says that no matter what convex thing you start with, it always goes to a point. So it seems like, so what I wanted to talk about is the dynamics of uh, convex ancient solutions. So convex, the set of convex surfaces, is a, it's a nice set. We have a flow on it, curve short, uh, mean curvature flow. What is the dynamics of that flow? This theorem uh, shows that the dynamics is really boring because everything just goes to a point. To, uh, right? The fate of every solution is the same there's nothing interesting. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to explain, so uh, I wrote with Toti and Natasha, we wrote a paper that is kind of long and uh, has a lot of steps and it's about one particular kind of ancient solution, the ancient ovals of certain type. Um, so I, instead of doing that in great detail uh, or, or any detail, I wanted to uh, show where it fits in the uh, in the larger scheme of all possible convex ancient solutions. So if you have, um, so 
So before talking about generalities, which I'll do in a second again, let me go back, let me, let's look at a few more examples. Uh, so one question you can ask, is there an analog Is there an analog of the paperclip in, for say, for two-dimensional services in R3? Right? The paperclip is this, uh, the thing that I just drew, these two Grim Reapers that, that uh, run towards each other and then become a circle. Um, and so the answer is yes. It turns out the, there are various answers depending, so the answer is yes in various different ways depending on what, you mean, what kind of analog you're looking for. So one analog is, um, so this is yes number one. Uh, so this is a construction by Brian White, which then later was done in more detail by uh, Robert Hasselhofer and Or Hershkowitz. And this is the solution that then uh, that uh, Daskalopoulos, Sesam, and I uh, looked at. Uh, so he came up with the following construction. Um, so there is no explicit formula for a solution to mean curvature flow, so we're out of luck there. Um, he said, let's do the following thing. I'll take, I know what a cylinder does. A cylinder just shrinks to a point. So here's my cylinder. It shrinks to, I said point, I meant line. A cylinder shrinks to a line, it's, uh, its rotation axis in finite time. Um, I'm going to cap this thing off. So what he said is I'll, uh, I'll take an infinite cylinder and I'll just take a finite segment of that thing. So here's the finite segment. So the, my initial surface has radius R and it has length L. Okay, and now this thing is going to shrink to um, so, and I cap it off, let's say just with flat disks. Right, so it's, um, it's a log. Um, under mean curvature flow, what does this thing do? It's a convex surface. Huskin says it becomes a sphere. Okay, but what happens, what happens in the meantime? before it becomes a sphere because, uh, so <coughs> for a really long time, if you're just looking at this central piece of the surface, if this L is really large, if you're just looking at the central piece of the surface, it looks like a cylinder, right? So if you, um, and uh, it's a heat equation, so it has infinite speed of propagation, but for the first amount of time, the, the effect of perturbations far away is always exponentially small. So you would think that, um, so there's, there's some sort of localization. Um, this thing is, it's like a cylinder. Um, so for a while, it'll just do the same as if it's a cylinder and it'll, it'll take a while for this to come in and spoil the cylindrical nature of the thing and make it more round, okay? So, um, Okay, so by taking limits, so assume the surface, uh, so um, this is M0, which becomes, which shrinks to, uh, so, which gives you a solution MT, and this thing depends on L and R, and this thing shrinks to a point, so let's say that M, MT LR shrinks to a point as T converges to capital T, uh, so it shrinks to a round point, let's say the origin, um, and this, the time it takes depends on L and R. Um, the, the larger you take the initial surface, the longer it will take for it to shrink to a point. Uh, so what uh, Brian White did is he said, I'm going to take a limit of these things, but first I'm going to translate them in time. So I'll look at M tilde, L, R, T is uh, M, L, R, and I'll, I'll just subtract this capital T, L, R. So I'll translate it in time so that the, the point, the time at which it shrinks to, uh, to a point is time zero. Okay, so now I have a solution to mean curvature flow that doesn't exist for positive time, but it exists for not all negative time, but as I make L and R larger for longer and longer time periods, 
going back in history. Okay, so then take limit. I said that before. So you let L and R go to infinity, and in the limit you get a solution You get an ancient solution. And these are all convex things, so in particular they're mean convex things, so um, at the time that Brian White was doing this, there was not that much theory uh, that you could apply. By now there is a lot of theory, and this conclusion that you get a limit in this case is, is something that you can, you can uh, look in your notes from last week and, and just uh, draw the conclusion. Uh, so this is an ancient solution, and now how do we know that this is not a sphere? Okay, a priori it could be a sphere. If you let L and R always be, if you choose L and R always to be equal, then what you're just doing is you're taking a finite, you know, sh short log and you're just making it larger, and this thing will, it'll become a sphere. Um, so you have to choose L and R. So what you have to do is you always have to choose L, L over R. You have to let, when you're choosing L and R, you have to uh, let R go to infinity, but L should be larger, much larger. Okay, and so if you, so for a suitable choice of L and R, going, both going to infinity, L much larger than R, you get an ancient solution that is not a sphere. Okay, so, and then he had a more detailed description. Hasselhofer and Hershkovitz later did the same construction and they gave more details of what the solution looks like. Um, In particular, they, uh, their construction, so I drew it here for something in R3. Uh, the construction that, that is written in by both of them is in RP cross RQ with the same kind of symmetry that I've been talking about these last couple of days. Uh, they produce surfaces with those uh, symmetry that are not spherical and they're, they're ancient solutions, convex ancient solutions of that type. Uh, so now you can ask a more detailed question What is the asymptotic shape of these surfaces as t goes to minus infinity, this particular ancient solution? And so the answer, uh, so there's a formal asymptotic answer which, which is, um, there's formal asymptotics, this was, so if you see formal asymptotics for the neck pinch and for a whole bunch of other things, uh, it's sort of like, uh, it's, it's not a very short calculation, but it's, it's like, like our calculus students do calculus problems. You've seen 100 problems, and here's another one that's like it. So we do the calculation, and you find an answer. Uh, so the, uh, the answer is, it's an ellipsoid, an actual ellipsoid. where this radius is square root, uh, it's the cylinder. So in the center, for going back in time, it, the thing looks like a cylinder, what I said here. If you look at the center part, it always looks like a cylinder. So the radius in the center is uh, minus 2t. And so I was thinking to the R3 case. Um, and the long axis, so it's rotationally symmetric in this direction, and the long axis is this times log t. So this follows from a formal matched asymptotic expansion, meaning there is no proof that uh, such a solution exists, or if a solution exists that it has to obey these things, there's, it's just a calculation, right? So no proofs. So uh, what, with, um, what we did is, um, what we first proved is uh, every solution has these asymptotic expansions. And now I say ancient oval and uh, so symmetric. 
So in this work, we, we assumed rotational symmetry. Every uh, symmetric ancient oval satisfies the asymptotics. I say it's an ellipsoid. It's, there's a, a little complication. If you look at the tip of this ellipsoid, if you, uh, if you calculate the curvature of the ellipsoid at this point, it turns out that the mean curvature ha is the, should coincide with the velocity of the ellipsoid. It's off by a factor. So there's, there's an extra complication, and you have to magnify this thing. And what it looks like there is, so the ellipsoid comes in like this. Uh, this part you have to cut out, and you have to replace it by what is called the bowl soliton. So it's the analog of the Grim Reaper. Uh, it's a rotationally symmetric surface that translates with constant velocity. And it looks like a paraboloid, but it is not exactly a paraboloid. So there's, um, so it is, it is an ellipsoid, except that the two tips where it is a more complicated thing. Okay, so um, every symmetric ancient oval satisfies these asymptotics. And then uh, theorem two. Um, is a uniqueness theorem, namely if you have two solutions that have the same asymptotics, right? So this theorem says that the solution that uh, Brian White constructed and the solution that Hasselhofer and Herskovitz constru constructed, they have the same asymptotics. They could still be the, because they use different procedures, different limiting uh, procedures, they could have been different solutions. So this theorem says that no, they are the same solutions. There is only one such solution, uh, one such ancient solution that uh, going back in time becomes really long like a cylinder and forward time has to go to a sphere. Um, so up to translation in time. And this theorem we also proved assuming symmetry. Uh, once we were almost done with this, um, Simon Brendle and uh, Choi uh, came up with a paper and they proved they proved uh, that all translating ancient, uh, non-compact ancient solutions are rotationally symmetric. And the techniques that they used could also be used here. And he, so he, he told us that uh, that might work here. And so we figured out that um, you can do a first step here. If you have, if you have a, solu a soliton that is like uh, an ancient oval that in backwards time converges to an, uh, a cylinder, uh, becomes elongated and like a cylinder, then it actually has to be rotationally symmetric, after which the previous stuff uh, that we have here applies. Okay, so... Um, so the proof of this is kind of long and has many, many steps, um, and I want to... So I'll say something about it. I, I want to draw the uh, bigger picture that I started to talk about here. So the first thing to do is uh, to look at, um, so suppose that MT is an ancient solution. I, I want to talk about the dynamics of ancient, of uh, convex uh, solutions to mean curvature flow, not necessarily compact uh, convex solutions. So if MT is an ancient solution, then um, then in many circumstances you can prove that uh, it converges to uh, so what I'm going to say now none of these are theorems these are uh, so these are ideas and it's, uh, these are theorems that are, uh, that are sometimes true and sometimes you know uh, still need proof uh, and sometimes they're not uh, so, many ancient solutions going back in time are asymptotic to self shrinkers. For example, uh, um, the solutions that I was talking there in backward time, if you only look at a compact space interval and you, you, sh so you shrink it down by a factor squared minus t, um, what you get, what you get to see is the self similar uh, shrinking cylinder. Um, so this tells me that instead of looking at 
if I'm going to look at ancient solutions, I shouldn't look at um, uh, at curvature, mean curvature flow. I should look at shrinking mean curvature flow. Where I do the substitution, I said m t is squared minus t times n, so I let this n vary, and I uh, call this, that's my new time variable, tau, and then n tau It evolves by velocity equals mean curvature. That's, uh, that's the highest order part plus one half x dot nu. X, the position vector, so anywhere on the surface of n and nu, it's unit normal there. So this is the, uh, this is our shrinking mean curvature flow. Uh, so what I really want to look at is the dynamics for solutions to this equation. Almost really, uh, there are, So fixed points for this, uh, for this dynamical system are things with velocity zero. So they are surfaces on which h plus one half x dot nu is zero. Uh, these are self shrinkers. And I'm only going to look at convex surfaces. And in one of his first papers on mean curvature flow, Huskin proved that there's, uh, there's a finite list of these, and they're very simple. They are the sphere, the cylinder, and higher cylinder, so in Rn. Uh, they are Rk, sorry, Rn minus k times Sk, and the radius of Sk is square root 2k. Okay, so these are generalized cylinders, right? So there's a whole sequence of these. So for each, for k, okay, so let me, so what do these look like? There is Sn, there is R cross Sn minus one. Um, in the theorem that we, these theorems that we proved, we didn't use uh, the symmetry that, so the symmetry that we, that we used is, uh, is the one that these have. So this one has our uh, SO1, O1 cross ON symmetry, right? Then there is R2 cross SN minus two, and so on. The last one would be RN minus one cross S1, but I also like to include this one, RN cross S0. Um, into this, so the, the, with the appropriate radii, these are these are all the shrink, uh, self shrinkers. So, what is S zero? Um, S n minus one is the boundary of B n. So S zero is the boundary of B one. It's the boundary of the interval minus one plus one. So it's the set with two points. So the the zero dimensional circle consists of two points. Um, And the radius that we have to give it is square root 2k. So it's two points, but they are at distance zero. So it's a double point. So the way to think, so if I have to draw these self-similar solutions, then I can't because they are not three-dimensional, but in higher dimensions, but we can make cartoons. So we have this, this is Sn, the next one is, so the next ones all look like this, where this axis is Rk, and this sphere is uh, Sn minus k, or Rn minus k, Sk, square root 2k, and the last one is Rn times a double point, so I think of that as a, it's a double plane. 
Okay, so all these are self-similar solutions um, to shrinking mean curvature flow. So these are fixed points for the flow. Uh, the flow is nice, it has a, um, it's a gradient flow and it, it has a Lyapunov functional. There's a quantity that is always decreasing um, along the flow. What quantity is that? Do we do Felix Otto? I'll, while I erase that, which thing would be, which quantity is decreasing along uh, this renormalized knee curvature flow? It begins with H. It's not Hamilton. Named after someone you saw last week. Yeah, okay, Huskin. It's the Huskin monotonicity formula. Yeah. So there are a couple of ways of writing Huskin's monotonicity formula. One way is um, to say that it is that the following quantity, H of a surface, N, tau, is, so there's a prefactor 4 pi over N over 2, integral e to the minus x squared over 4 d mu over N of tau. So Huskin's functional is this along a solution to, to um, right, so the, the, if you write the Huskin monotonicity formula for mean curvature flow, it's a more complicated formula because you have to divide by time here, but because uh, in this situation we have rescaled by time, uh, the, the expression simplifies a bit. This thing is monotone along solutions for mean curvature flow. That's, that's completely equivalent with uh, Huskin's monotonicity uh, formula, right? So we have D, It's less than or equal to zero, and it is only equal to zero on, uh, on shrinkers. Okay, so this quantity is decreasing on, uh, on any convex ancient solution, um, and it will be constant on these things. And I have written these things in this order because, um, so if you write the, uh, yeah, so uh, let me know. Inequalities are exactly the wrong way around, sorry. Um, so this means that for um, the uh, shrinking mean curvature flow, you, there cannot be a solution that starts here and ends up like that, right? They have to, you can start here and you can end up over there. And Huskin's theorem says that if you're compact and convex, you always end up here, okay? Uh, could you have a solution that uh, has this as a limit? And so the answer is yes, but you, not if you start as a compact surface, because if you start as a compact surface, then uh, Huskin's theorem says you always end up being a sphere. So uh, there are non-compact initial data that end up here. For example, it's a fixed point. You could start being this, and then you would never change. But you could also, by Grayson's theorem, you could take any, any curve in the plane and then do a cylinder, you know, construct a cylinder on this, uh, on this curve. Um, how does this evolve by mean curvature flow? Well, the extra uh, cross R that I have done is irrelevant. You just evolve this curve by curve shortening. It becomes, it becomes convex, becomes a circle, and then in the end shrinks, that circle shrinks to a point by gauge Hamilton. Now you remember that we have uh, the cylinder over this thing, and so you see that in the limit it converges to this, uh, to this cylinder. it provides a lower bound. So, um, so there is such an upper bound 
And so it's, it's one, of the, one of the steps that we had to do in our proof. Uh, so it's fairly easy because if, um, but it's not, it doesn't come like this. So if you have a convex set, you just cover it with certain, with a finite number of caps. Each of those is a graph. And if it's a graph, you write out the, uh, the Huskin functional for a graph and you find that it's, um, you find that this, you can bound the contribution of each, each cap by this integrated over Rn. Yes, it gives you an upper bound, not the best upper bound. So I think the best upper bound is this guy. So it's two. Um, okay, so let me show you more solutions. So the solution that I've shown you, the, the ancient oval that I've drawn before, you can think of that as a connecting orbit between this fixed point and that fixed point because it starts out being like a cylinder and then it, uh, it comes in from infinity and then it becomes rounder and rounder and converges to being, to being a sphere. So um, one or two years ago, there's a, uh, three people, uh, Bourney, Langford, and Tinaglia. Um, they constructed, so re, uh, I remember the question, does there exist an analog of the paperclip in, uh, in R3? And I gave you yes number one. So here's yes number two. So let's go back. And I think this is a better yes, because uh, what, so if you, what would you be your first, or one of your first 10 guesses for what the analog should be? One of the things that you could do, and you, that you could hope is you could say, well, I take, I take the paper clip and put a vertical axis here, and I swing it around like that. Uh, so what you get is, um, What you get is an ain, being Dutch, I like to think of, so it looks like this. So they call it a pancake because it's, it's, if you go very far back in time, it looks like this. It's very flat. Um, so it's like a really flat pancake and it shrinks to, uh, so the edges, the edges are like Grim Reapers. This edge has the shape of a Grim Reaper and therefore it is moving inward. The top is pretty much flat, the bottom is flat. Being Dutch, I would draw it in yellow. And I think of it as a cheese. There, it's an ancient cheese that is shrinking. Um, okay, so there's an ancient solution. So this is what you would get if you take the paper clip and you rotate it around an axis. Uh, what you get is not exactly a solution to mean curvature flow. It turns, so it's, it, there's no explicit formula for uh, this ancient solution. So what they, what they managed to do is to construct a solution that pretty much is like this. So, uh, so theorem by those three people, um, there exists an ancient pancake. Okay, so in forward time, what does this thing do? It, it just, it obeys Huskin and it becomes, it's, it's, it's convex, so it just becomes a sphere. Uh, in backward time, what does it do? Well, it just fills out, so the cross section seen from a side, the cross section is, is this. Uh, this width doesn't change. You could assume that uh, that is one. And so here I'm drawing solutions to mean curvature flow, not to rescale mean, mean curvature flow. So backward times, uh, this thing just fills up the whole slab between plus and minus one, or a slab of width one, width one. If you do a rescaled mean curvature flow, then as you go back in time, you have to shrink the thing by a factor square root of time. So under rescaled mean curvature flow, This distance is much larger than square root time, so this still becomes a large distance, and this distance becomes 
uh, 1 over square root minus time. So it goes to 0. So in backward time, this thing converges to a double plane. Um, so they constructed this thing, and within the class of rotationally symmetric solutions, they show that this thing is unique. Um, so, and it is, so that, so there, the Bourne Langford Tinaglia solution is a connecting orbit between these two. Um, there is reason to believe that um, in this case, rotational symmetry is not uh, necessary, that there might be non symmetric versions of this thing. Um, let me not go into that. Okay, so what is the complete picture? So we don't know yet, but it, it should have, it should look like this. So Bourne, Langford, Tinaglia could produce the old pancake. Let me call it the pancake. Solution that converges from here to here. There is, so this is in R3. Then the cylinder is, uh, so the only self-similar solutions, how many fixed points are there for the for uh, shrinking mean curvature flow in R3? The, the generalized cylinders are S0 cross a plane, so the double plane S1 cross a Cross R and asked S2. This is S2, I'm sorry. Um, all right, these are. All right, the exponents have to add up to 2. Um, so, White and then Hasselhofer, Hershkowitz, and then. Uh, Toti and Natasha, we studied this particular thing. So this one we know is unique within the class of rotationally solution, uh, symmetric solutions. This one is unique. There is a connecting orbit from here to here. And that one is easy to come by. Namely, you take the paper clip cross R. Okay, so you have a shrinking paper clip like this. Build a cylinder on that thing. So in backwards time, this thing converges to a double plane. In forward time, it shrinks to a cylinder. Right? So we have, so now the total dynamics that we have is three fixed points. And connecting orbits between them. And it can't be that this is everything, because the space of, connected, of convex surfaces, and now let's assume that they are all reflection symmetric so that we know that they converge at the origin, and we, uh, we allow, we mod out by rescaling so that we, know, we can always be sure that they converge, that they, uh, if they, that they converge at time zero, and then so, which is important for the rescaled mean curvature flow. The space of surfaces is connected. Right, so everything should be, uh, this thing has to be a de deformation retract of the whole space because under a flow, everything in forward time has to, con uh, if you, has to converge to one of these things. Again, this is not a theorem, this is an idea. Uh, but, but it sounds like something that could be proved. So uh, that means that this is not, these are not the only solutions. There have to be other solutions like this. So this thing has to have a two-dimensional unstable manifold. This thing has a one-dimensional unstable manifold. This thing is an attractor. Uh, so what does that mean? There, are, there should be solutions that in backward time converge to a double plane. In forward time, they, um, they converge to, they behave like the paper clip cross R, and they converge to a cylinder. But then once they get to a cylinder, they suddenly become, uh, they discover that they are compact. So how would I make one of those? I would take the paper clip cross R. So this thing I would give length R, and then I would make take this take the product with 
not R, but a really long interval. Okay, so how is this thing going to shrink? So in backwards time, uh, you, so this is an ancient solution that is uh, asymmetric. Um, it is, uh, in backward time, it is, uh, it's like a really long re rectangle and it converges to a double plane in forward, but it is convex. Uh, and Sorry, it is compact, right? Because I've made it bounded and convex and closed. So it's compact. In forward time, what it does is it, uh, this will shrink. Uh, this is the first thing that shrinks. And uh, so it becomes a cylinder, but once it gets close to a cylinder, uh, you start noticing that the surface actually has, uh, it's not a complete cylinder, it's a, it's a thing with finite length, which is the initial value that Brian White used to construct his ancient oval. And then it starts, so after that, it would have to do this, right? So there should be a whole family of solutions uh, like that. And then in higher dimensions, you, there, uh, you can imagine how the picture goes, right? You can, you can take this picture and multiply it with R. Then you get a whole bunch of solutions in higher dimensions. And this then has become a cylinder, and then somewhere down there, there's S3, and there should be more connecting orbits, right? So the, uh, I think an interesting thing to look at would be to complete this picture. What does the complete flow look like? Um, okay, so. I, I have more stuff here. There is, uh, so there is the proof of the theorem with Natasha and uh, Toti, um, which has very many steps. Um, somewhere in the, in the proof, um, this foliation by self-shrinkers comes up. So I, I just want to state that fact, but I'm, I think it's Friday and everybody is ready for a break, I think. So I'll just state this fact and stop. So somewhere in the... And I, so I'm saying this because I think, so what we, uh, what we constructed are self-shrinkers. Uh, they're not complete self-shrinkers. If you, so if you look at self-shrinking surfaces of rotation, what do they look like? Well, there's the, there's the cylinder. This is one of them. These are solutions to this differential equation. One more time, ux x plus, uh, divided by one plus ux squared uh, minus x over two ux minus one over u, oh, plus u over two. This differential equation. So the cylinder is one of them. The sphere is another. Um, and then you can, uh, so there are other surfaces that start perpendicularly here. What do those look like? So you can make computer picture of these fairly easily. Um, they behave like an ellipsoid. This part is like an ellipsoid, which is part of the reason why this asymptotics, why this thing is, sorry, not this one, the other one is like an ellipsoid. Uh, they're not complete. Once you follow, so for a long time until you reach a certain particular number here, so in three dimensions, this is roughly five. Everything is fine. You can make a whole bunch of these and you get a foliation. Uh, if you take one of these and you go beyond five, uh, you have to give up that they are graphs because they want to do this. Right? You, you get strange pictures like this. They, are, they become curves that self-intersect and it becomes, uh, becomes a mess or really pretty depending on what colors you put in the picture. Um, but certainly not, nothing embedded. Um, so this part turns out to be useful because this is a foliation and these are minimal surfaces, not for the standard area functional, but for Huskin's functional. And so if you take the unit normals to these surfaces, they satisfy divergence of, not of the normal, because that would just give you uh, H, but E to the minus X squared over four. Yeah, this thing, this is zero, because if you calculate this divergence, you get exactly, oh, well, it's gone you get uh, that divergence turns out to be exactly H uh, plus, what am I? Um, and this allows you to compare the Huskin functional of any surface that you have, like your solution with say that of the cone or with one of these shrinkers. And this, um, this helps you deal with the various estimates that, you, that are needed in the proof. Also, these special solutions can be used as barriers 
for ancient solutions. So um, I, I think I should stop there. I, oh, so I would like to thank the organizers for uh, this really great week. I hope everybody got something out of this. Uh, it was certainly worthwhile.